The Nightmare Creatures series is one of the more notable, interesting series to pop up in the early days of 3D gaming. The series gets planned comparisons to Bloodborne, and for good reason. Plague Redden streets of mid-19th century London with things that go bump in the night. That said, Nightmare Creatures 2 is more in the vein of Bloodborne. The first game is more hack and slash, with level design similar to classic FPS titles. While it falls victim to some issues plaguing early 3D titles, it's still a blast to play and one you can pick up at any time. Nightmare Creatures 2 is slower, more spread out, more linear in its design. In ways, much more like Bloodborne, but it's a sequel that pushed the hardware of the PlayStation to its absolute limits. As a result, cutbacks were made in other areas like gameplay. Nightmare Creatures 2 is a case of one step forward, several steps back. It's one of the more disappointing sequels I've played. With that, let's look into the Nightmare Creatures series. Where the games go right, where they go wrong, and why they're still worth checking out. At least the first game. No more screams, eh? That's what happens when you impale a man through the heart. Nightmare Creatures is one of those old-school gaming stories that remains in the background. There's an intro cutscene, text on loading screens between levels, and the game manual. Ah, the days of game manuals. They could add so much life and character to a game. The year is 1834. Plague has spread across London. Ignatius Blackbird, a priest and expert in the occult, finds a tome left at his doorstep. The tome contains the diary of one Samuel Pepys. 170 years ago, Samuel stopped the Brotherhood of Hectate's diabolical experiments. In attempts to create more powerful human beings, their experiments created heinous monsters. Samuel Pepys destroyed the Brotherhood and their experiments through fire, which spread throughout London. This was the Great Fire of 1666. Samuel Pepys was an actual historical figure, who kept a diary about this time frame of London, the time frame from 1660 to 1671. His diary chronicled events like the Great Plague along with the Great Fire. Of course, real-world events were different than what happened here. He didn't cause the Great Fire of 1666 in reality. Samuel kept a record of the experiments and arcane formulas for creating organic mutations from the Brotherhood of Hectate. This discovery causes Ignatius, the priest, to send the tome to Dr. G. Neff in New Orleans. A world expert in immunology, he heads to London with his daughter Nadia in tow. Before Ignatius and Jean can meet, Jean is murdered. The tome missing. Nadia receives a note from one Adam Crowley and the Brotherhood of Hectate. Come find them and stop them if they dare. With that, we're off to stop Adam Crowley and the monstrosities unleashed upon London. And should no one stop him, this city will be consumed by a horde of nightmare creatures. Now with a last name like Crowley, I'm guessing Adam has a relation to Alistair Crowley. Although Alistair wouldn't be born for another 40-ish years or so after the events of Nightmare Creatures. Oh Mr. Crowley, what went on your head? In Nightmare Creatures, we could either play as Ignatius or Nadia, each with their own unique skill set and combos. Ignatius is slower in movement, using a staff to ward off enemies. Nadia uses a sword and is far more agile, nimble, and more fun to play. For most of my time in Nightmare Creatures, I played as Nadia. Before making this video, I haven't played either games in the Nightmare Creatures series. I've been aware of the series for a long time, seen them in action, but never with a controller in my hand. This time frame of early 3D gaming is a fascinating one to look back on time frame before best practices emerged in how to handle 3D movement and cameras. Nightmare Creatures came out in late 1997. All things considered, it handles well for the time frame and has aged pretty well. The year before, in 1996, there were three landmark titles in how they handled 3D movement in the third person. That being Super Mario 64, Tomb Raider, and Resident Evil. Mario 64 set a benchmark for 3D platforming. Tomb Raider would take a grid-based approach. Resident Evil would use tank controls with fixed camera angles. Not the first of their kind, but ones that set the benchmarks moving forward. Nightmare Creatures handles more in the vein of Tomb Raider. Not quite a grid system, but it's evident in movement and combat. In one-on-one -on -one combat, controls handle great. It's easy to dodge, block, get your moves in. Blocking is noble and nullifying almost all attacks. When in close range of an enemy, the camera will snap to your opponent. I found this reasonable and didn't find it causing too many issues. There were a few stretches where the camera would get in the way, but this was a rare occurrence. Nightmare Creatures does a good job of spreading out enemies, so most encounters remain one on one. That said, there were a few set encounters where group combat occurs. Things get more tricky with where the camera will snap to. You may find yourself in the position of the camera snapping to the enemy who leaped into the back. Again, these encounters are rare, so it's nothing too egregious, but worth noting. It's the platforming where Nightmare Creatures stumbles in its controls. Our characters aren't adept at swimming, resulting in instant death. Now, there are some decent quality of life features. For example, while attacking, you won't fall off a platform as a result of forward movement. That's some great foresight on the developer's part. That said, you can get knocked off by enemy attacks. Still, this was a rare occurrence. There weren't many enemy encounters located near water. To make a more direct comparison to a Souls-like, I'd hold my breath while making a precise jump. There's one early sewer level that's egregious with it. You have to be precise or else you'll lose a life. 
One great example is a section of trying to get to these docks surrounded by giant octopi. It's easy for them to knock you off a platform. Your jumps need to be precise between platforms. There are few items you could grab on one of them. Grabbing items can be awkward in nightmare creatures. Some items you pick up right off the ground, those drop by enemies. Then you have items that you find in boxes or elsewhere. You need to face them and hit a button to grab them, which can be a bit iffy at times to have your position right. But all things considered, the game handles well for an early 3D entry. When people talk about games not aging well, I find many from this time frame of early 3D gaming as suitable candidates, where movement in the third dimension and camera systems were still unexplored territory. Yes, there are some issues with how Nightmare Creatures handles, but it's not a huge detriment. Hats off to the developers not falling victim to what was so common in those days with 3D gaming. Combat handles well for the most part. The left and right shoulder buttons allow you to dodge left or right. Dodging feels satisfying with the ground it covers. There are several combos for each character in Nightmare Creatures. The manual lists a few, but further experimentation allows you to discover others. I settled on a good 4-5 to five combos for Nadia to use at any given time. Some to break enemy stances, some to slice off limbs. The Smembrant system is pretty impressive for its time. For most enemies, a combo that takes off limbs will finish a fight. Others will continue to fight on, limbs missing. One enemy that can be fun to fight is the Dockers. Depending on your finishing blows, they'll stand until you let them fall to the ground. You can continue to rain down blows and take away body parts for some laughs. There's a decent sized enemy roster to deal with in Nightmare Creatures. Werewolves, dockers, zombies, insects, spiders, rats, octopus, harpies, demons, hellhounds, gargoyles. Combine this with the foggy, plague-written streets of mid-19th century London, it's easy to make bloodborne comparisons. While ground-based enemies may have different looks and sizes, their combat patterns tend to remain the same. Flying enemies will throw a few more hurdles your way. As this is a fifth-generation title, there's enough detail and textures to flesh out enemies, but still leaves room to fill in the blanks. There's a reason the style presentation is popular amongst indie developers. With technology limitations, draw distance remains limited. This adds to the unease of what's around the next corner. Music also does wonders for building out the atmosphere. Now there is a caveat with the combo system. Inputting your combo can be a bit iffy. In the heat of the moment during combat, it's easy to rush your inputs and not pull off the combo you want. Sure, you can button mash your way through the game, but getting those precise combos to take off limbs makes a world of difference. One combo with a slash can be enough to kill an enemy. Otherwise, you might be button mashing for some time. There's one combo of Nadia's that's great for slicing up enemies. On a PS1 controller, it's XX then back and square at the same time. Two kicks followed by a spinning slash. Thing is, more often than not, I would get the three kick combo instead. There's another great combo of breaking an enemy's stance with a heavy kick, ending with an overhead slash. But again, this overhead slash came out less than I wished. This is by far the largest issue with the controls of Nightmare Creatures. Trying out the N64 version, it felt a bit better, but there were still issues with it. For the PC version, when I could get it to run, I had a similar issue. In Nightmare Creatures, there are several power-ups at our disposal. One time usage to deal with enemies, like guns. One can be a single shot, another will do a 360 spin while firing. You have proximity mines, firebombs, and dynamite. You could use chaos skulls to get enemies to fight one another. The one I enjoyed most was the repulsive smoke. Toss one down to keep monsters at bay. It's as if they bottled the smell of Smash Brothers players. There's some of the more useful side items I've come across in the game. Handy in any situation. You might be low on health and not want to risk taking damage, so use a power-up instead. You'll find them spread out amongst levels, and you'll want to find them. Nightmare Creatures is no walk in the park. Level design is in the vein of classic FPS titles like Doom. The way levels will loop around and back, with several side paths and secrets. At the end of a level, you're shown the enemy's kill percentage and items found percentage. There were several times I thought I was thorough in the exploration of a level, only to discover I missed a good chunk of items. There is a map, which while not the greatest in how it handles, gives you an idea of where you've been. It's easy to get lost due to the low level vision. The worst mechanic and greatest flaw of Nightmare Creatures is the adrenaline meter. 
This depletes on the regular, which refills by killing enemies. If it drops to zero, your health starts to whittle away. While not an issue at first, as Nightmare Creatures progresses, the adrenaline meter drops at a faster rate. On one hand, the adrenaline meter keeps you moving forward, seeking out enemies to kill. The issue is how it cuts into the exploration. You might want to head down a side path to see what's over there. While some areas will loop around, others will be a dead end. So when you come back, you may not have enemies along the way to refill your adrenaline meter. Your trip may end up being a net loss. Due to the game's difficulty, you'll want to seek out power-ups to have on hand, along with finding weapon upgrades, health, and lives. The adrenaline system is a total clash with the game. Take this with a grain of salt, but someone claimed to have worked on Nightmare Creatures gave its reasoning. This is one of the top comments on Josh Strife's video on Nightmare Creatures. While I can't confirm it's a legitimate, but does make sense in its reasoning. It was a last minute addition to the game, as in a few days before the game would go gold. Before the adrenaline meter, you could run past all your enemies and finish the game in very little time. The publisher noticed this and wanted a quick solution. The adrenaline system is the result. I'm sure if they had more time, they would have done a different solution like having to clear out a certain percentage of enemies before you could complete a level, or clearing out enemies to open a path forward. Or, you know, they didn't need to bother at all. Bring up Doom again, you can run past most enemies if you want to, say for a few instances. You could say that for a lot of games, actually. At least in the N64 version released a year later, you could disable the adrenaline meter in the options. At various points, we'll see Adam Crowley, just out of reach, escaping. At the end of levels, we'll also get some short blurbs from Mr. Crowley. These do a lot to add to his character and remind us of what's at stake. Ah, run, run, run into the arms of death. Give it up. I'll murder you the way I murdered that imbecile Dr. Jean F. Society funded my experiments, and now it shall destroy itself. How beautiful. The rest is silence. Prepare to die. Before we reach Adam, we'll have a few bosses throughout. They can be frustrating, trial and error affairs. They wouldn't feel out of place in a Crash Bandicoot game with their structure. One example is the snow creature in a church. You have to chuck dynamite at the explosive barrels next to him. He'll chuck giant snowballs at us. It's easy to get caught in the dreaded stun lock with them. As mentioned earlier, grabbing items can be a bit iffy. Lying yourself up in front of them and hitting a button can take a moment. Replenishing your dynamite while avoiding snowballs isn't the smoothest of tasks. Another annoying boss is against this knife thrower. Trying to throw switches while avoiding these knives isn't the most pleasant experience. Like the snow creature, it's easy to fall victim to the dreaded stun lock. Finally, we come face to face with Crowley himself. No gimmicks here, it's a straight up fight to the death. This took many tries to take him down, finding that timing between his attacks only to have my combo miss as he dodges, or dodging one of his combos and getting several hits in. While frustration levels rose, it was a different kind of frustration, more myself instead of stunlock issues with other bosses or dealing with gimmicks. I was finally able to slay Crowley, cue credits. An unknown figure arises to claim Crowley's head. Nightmare Creatures is not a long game, but very much a replayable one. Whether switching characters, seeing how fast you can complete a level, or how many monsters you killed or items found. As well, you can unlock a mode to play as the monsters. More of a novelty. I would get my ass handed to me. Still, it's a fun little unlockable to give these monsters a spin. While it does show its age and is a bit rough around the edges, Nightmare Creatures is a blast and an addicting game. And not in the modern gaming kind of way. It's one where gameplay is king, an arcade-like feel with old-school FPS level design. 
as this was the early days of 3D, the amount they were able to get right is very commendable. It's one of those games you could fire up at any point and have a blast. Nightmare Creatures 2 would release two and a half years later in 2000. You would think they would continue in the same vein as the original, with some tweaks along the way. Well, they took the game in a much different direction, resulting in one of the more disappointing sequels I've played. I had stayed too long in my cell, my lair, tormented by inner demons. But I could lament no longer. She needed me. My nightmare was just about to begin. While it does have its merits, Nightmare Creatures 2 is a sequel that misses so much of what made the original special. It's not Devil May Cry 2 or Deus Ex Invisible War levels of disappointing, but it is up there. For every step forward, Nightmare Creatures 2 takes several steps back. Several cases of fixing what wasn't broken, leading to further issues. Like the first game, Nightmare Creatures 2 has a similar, minimal story. You get short blurbs during loading screens between levels, cutscenes, and the game manual. The year is 1934, a hundred years after the first Nightmare Creatures. Adam Crowley returns, having spent the last hundred years regaining his strength. His goal is to summon an ancestral being of great power to merge with. After the event of the first Nightmare Creatures, Ignatius and Nadia founded the Circle, a secret organization to keep evils such as Adam at bay. In a surprise attack, Crowley massacres the Circle and takes prisoner one of its members, Herbert Wallace, our main character and only playable character. Crowley tortures experiments on Herbert for years. One day he's able to escape and heads out to stop Crowley. This is where the game begins proper. One thing that's noticeable right away is the upgrade in the presentation of Nightmare Creatures 2. The frame rate is higher. The graphic fidelity is a large jump. The draw distance is greater. This is a mid-2000s release. This is the tail end of the first PlayStation and the dawn of the PlayStation 2. Nightmare Creatures 2 pushes the PlayStation to its limits. It's incredible the difference a couple years can make in pushing consoles to their limits back in the day. There was no N64 version of Nightmare Creatures 2. The reason given was due to low sales, but I also wonder if the system simply wouldn't be able to handle it, or if they tried would require major cutbacks due to storage limitations. Now of course, there is a trade-off for this upgrade in fidelity, one that turns Nightmare Creatures 2 into a disappointing sequel. One is the streamlining of the combat system. You have all but two combos in Nightmare Creatures 2, square XX or X square square. Kicks are separate and not part of any combos. Now more combos doesn't make a combat system better by default. In the original Nightmare Creatures, of all possible options, I used around 4 to 5 for each character, but to strip down this much is overkill. Now, like the YouTube comment about the adrenaline system in the first Nightmare Creatures, I did come across a possible explanation. There was a point where I got stuck in Nightmare Creatures 2 and looked at a playthrough on YouTube. One of the top comments claimed to have worked on the game. While I can't verify the validity, they did give a lot of information and details that seemed plausible. Not only for Nightmare Creatures 2, but other projects the studio worked on. According to this comment, they cut back on combos due to memory limitation. They had to remove a third combo to have enough free memory. They pushed the system to its absolute limits. It makes me curious what Nightmare Creatures 2 would have been like had they built it around the 6th generation instead of the tail end of the 5th. Now that said, Nightmare Creatures 2 did release on the Dreamcast. Thing is, it's a basic upscale port with a higher frame rate. Nightmare Creatures 2 is one of the many, many PS1 to Dreamcast ports. There are around 150 of them. Continuing with the combat system. I didn't have any issues with combo inputs like the original, but there was a frustrating change to combo output. In the first Nightmare Creatures, you could input a combo and it would play out regardless if you hit your enemy. This could be handy in many situations. Your first hit may miss, but the slash won't, dismembering your enemy. In Nightmare Creatures 2, if you don't get that first hit, the combo won't continue. Enemies now have health bars, are more spread out, and take longer to kill. Get enemy health down far enough and you can perform a fatality. Each enemy type will have a unique fatality animation. The fatalities are okay, but at this point I've almost killed them. A couple more hits tends to be enough. Some of these fatalities can take a while to play out, which gets annoying over time. Wow. 
I prefer doing this myself in the first Nightmare Creatures by slicing them up. Now there is one enemy type that pops up later where fatalities open up far earlier. It's a relief as they're one of the harder enemies to deal with, and the fatality is quite satisfying. There are other quirks to the combat system that you have to get used to, like how enemies can interrupt your combos. Once you get a feel for it, you could see it coming. Go for too many combos in a row and it'll interrupt with a grab. There's also the quirk that kicking an enemy down isn't a free combo after. Enemies love to grab you after you try a combo after kicking them down. It's very frustrating to be caught in a grab. <laughs> Although I like this one move where they do a reverse bane on you, right to the ribs. Several enemies will do a roar and idle animation, at which point you could charge them with a combo. Beyond the docker returning, most enemies in Nightmare Creatures 2 are new. They come in different shapes and sizes, but like the original, most play on the same way in dealing with them. Dodging is far less helpful here. In the original Nightmare Creatures, your strafe left or right covered a great distance. Here it's very small. Most attempts at a dodge resulted in damage. Better to dodge back or block. Power-ups return, and they're as satisfying as they were in the original. There are a couple of notable new power-ups I was always happy to stumble over. There are a few variations of guns available. One results in the enemy exploding into pieces. <laughs> On a similar note, there is a jar of flies. Now at first, when I picked it up, I thought it would hold enemies in place as I chip away at their health. Very common in video games. Think the insect swarm in the Bioshock games. In Nightmare Creatures 2, this swarm explodes your enemy into pieces. I always chuckled when using it. And you'll want to be using items because some of these encounters can take a long time. In the original, if you're able to pull off dismemberment, you can finish a fight in the flash and move on to the next one. In Nightmare Creatures 2, you have to whittle down that health bar. It would get to the point where I started to roll my eyes as levels would go on with further combat encounters. What was enjoyable in the first game becomes a chore here. While controls are tighter in Nightmare Creatures 2, there is a change that causes issues. If you want to leave a combat encounter, you need to hold down the button to return to explore mode. Thing is, many situations require combat to advance, like opening the next door. This change also results in frustrations of picking up items during combat. While Nightmare Creatures 2 doesn't have the awkward pick up item button action, combat makes it more difficult to pick up items. One time I wanted to grab this one power up during combat, but for whatever reason, Wallace wouldn't. I had to hold the shoulder button to enable exploration mode to pick it up. This took far longer than needed and resulted in unnecessary damage. Health is used on pickup instead of being an item to use, another choice I disagreed with. In a game like this, giving you the option of when to heal is the better one. Along with the change in the combat system, Nightmare Creatures 2 takes a different approach to level design. Levels are fewer, but far longer. Some could take a good 30 to 40 minutes. There are short loading screens throughout, or enemy cutscenes to mask loading screens. Again, this shows how far they push the PS1. Levels are far more linear, and do away with the FPS-like Doom feel to their layout. In making the Bloodborne comparisons, Nightmare Creatures 2 is far more in that vein. The combat is slower paced, and the level structure fits more in that vein, to an extent. I did fire up the fan demake of the PS1 Bloodborne afterwards, and you could feel the similarities. But there is one large difference in how levels play out here. There are next to no cases of looping level design, where you open up a shortcut to a prior area, something I would have appreciated. There are several times per level where paths will branch off. One path will need a key or explosive to clear the path forward. This item will be on the other path. Instead of looping back to it afterward, you return the way you came, with more enemies in place. Now, I did tend to pick the right path first, the path that gave me an item to progress forward. Was this a case of luck or subtle guidance? Looking back at the footage, I don't see the subtle guidance. Lady Luck appeared to be on my side. There are cases where the obstacle of one path is further back. You might go through a few enemies and discover you need to go the other path to find the required item to progress. I wish they kept the same level structure of the original. It works so well beyond a few exceptions. This shift also cuts back on secrets. There are next to no secret paths. 
Hidden power-ups are instead tucked away behind breakables or windows. Now, there are some positives here, like the adrenaline meter, which is nowhere to be found. You're free to explore at your own leisure. Another nice change is no longer falling through death and water. This time, you could swim. Controls handle fine here, and the game is very generous in your air meter. You're never in a major rush in fighting with the controls. Nightmare Creatures 2 uses several stock sound effects that pop up in other games. Related to swimming, emerging from the water is the same sound as taking damage in GoldenEye 007. This one tentacle enemy? They use the same sound for Bowser in Mario Kart 64, an enemy from the original System Shock. One enemy uses the same sound as an enemy from Doom. And opening certain doors is the same sound in Vampire Bloodlines. No doubt they've popped up in other games. Most of these look to come from the General Series 6000 sound effects library, released in 1992, a collection that has a little over 7500 sound effects. Always throws me for a loop when you hear these sounds elsewhere. You associate them with a certain game. There is a pause of, wait, where have I heard that sound before? There are no level completion stats. Instead, you get a simple congratulations. Then again, I wasn't hankering to return to these levels to see if I could do better this time around. As mentioned earlier, in the first Nightmare Creatures, I could fire up at any point, play a few levels, and have a great time. I have little desire to return to Nightmare Creatures 2. Unlike the first game, Adam Crowley has little presence. Whereas we would get short blurbs from him at the end of levels, instead we get Wallace providing exposition. Some during the loading screen, some at moments throughout levels, and some during cutscenes between levels. All these documents were about ancient cults, summoning of creatures once feared or worshipped. One name was recurring, Baphomet, the Devouring Death. I feared then that this demented sorcerer planned to use this forbidden knowledge for his own purposes. The creature in the museum was certainly linked with all this. The passage led to the Paris underground. The catacombs were not far away. I was sure that Crowley's creatures were using this maze as a secret base. I felt then that I was about to reach the heart of this... Now I'm not going to play the audio of these cutscenes because that's going to result in a copyright strike. These cutscenes feature the music of Rob Zombie. Bit silly? Sure, but it's part of the late 90s, early 2000s charm. As far as a musical fit goes, you could do a lot worse than Rob Zombie for a series like Nightmare Creatures. While we start in London, our journey will take us to Paris. We'll see Rachel throughout, part of the circle. Someone who is supposed to be a playable character but ended up on the cutting room floor. The last encounter has us climbing up the Eiffel Tower to stop this monstrosity. And that's it? What about Crowley? Rachel was safe, the horror defeated. But while I savoured the brief taste of victory, I was all too aware that Crowley, hidden in some dark and sordid place, continued to weave his evil web of darkness. I knew then that I would continue to the bitter end. Back to that YouTube comment, there are plans for several more levels that were cut for time which is common for games. But here it's in the vein of something like Halo 2 where it ends out of nowhere. To be fair, I was more than ready for Nightmare Creatures 2 to wrap up. While a longer game, it's still not a long one by any stretch. Even then, it wore out its welcome long before ending. This leads to Nightmare Creatures 2 being one of the more disappointing sequels I've played. Title caught in the generation purgatory where it pushed its hardware to its absolute limits. Had they built it around the sixth generation of hardware, the Dreamcast, the Xbox, the GameCube, the PlayStation 2, I would have loved to see what they would have done. There's still something quite enjoyable here, somewhat of a Bloodborne prototype in its feel, a Bloodborne before Bloodborne, but something that could have been so much more. And we never got to experience a sixth generation Nightmare Creatures. The third title was in development, but the studio, Callisto Entertainment, went bankrupt in 2002. Ubisoft was set to publish the game, but instead took over development after Callisto closed. The game was going to be set in 19th century Prague. They released short blurbs of footage and art, but in the end, Nightmare Creatures 3 never saw the light of day. Now, Ubisoft taking over development seems like a bit of an iffy thing. 
But you gotta remember, this was the early 2000s. The Ubisoft that delivered the Splinter Cell games, the Prince of Persia games, Beyond Good and Evil, the Rayman games. Too bad we never got to see what it was like. Albino Moose Games announced a remake in 2017, but confirmed in 2020 that it was shelved. Leaving us with a great first title that's a bit rough around the edges, and a sequel that's a bummer as a follow-up. Still, it's an interesting series that feels like Bloodborne before Bloodborne existed, even with the great differences and approaches to design. They come from a time frame when gameplay was king, where the story remained in the background, well before a time of best practices emerging in how to develop 3D games. There were some growing pains, but there's much to commend with how much the Nightmare Creatures series got right as an early 3D title. As mentioned earlier before this video, I was familiar with the series but never played them. I'm happy to note how well the series has aged. A series that could be a nice template for budding indie developers out there. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so already, like, subscribe, leave a comment. If you want to support the channel further, consider becoming a patron member or a YouTube member. You'll get access to videos earlier, the forthcoming credits, and what I've been working on.